Sometimes you're in a fight with a partner or they're going through something. They're going through something and you just want to fix it. They're going through a big challenge. They're lashing out at you or something, but you want to fix it. And so you, you step in and you're trying to fix it. You're trying to help them through it. And the question I ask myself is I realize I can't heal them. I can't actually fix this for them. So the question isn't to ask myself, how can I fix this for them? The question is, how, what is the space that I'm holding for them so it's most conducive for them to find their way through it? Hey, Topaz, welcome to the show. So great to have you. Now, I'm really curious to know what piqued your curiosity in intimacy and human connection? The human experience via conversations in relationship. And we have all kinds of relationships and it's been an amazing journey for now 11 years. And what's in the book, it's basically a guide to intimate conversations and deeper relationships. I mean, you're teaching people, right, with how to connect and how to create more rapport, if you will, and how to have confidence and really engage and connect with people. And I'm sharing that in the, in the similar in the form of the book, but more about exploratory cathartic conversations that illuminate your connection with someone else. That is fascinating. Can you tell us uh, how this project started for you? We started uh, by asking the question, how's the experience of being human changing in lieu of all these digital technologies 10, 11 years ago, right? You're seeing how people are relating, how people are dating, I mean, you guys, you guys have seen it. You've been around for 17 years. You guys, you know that what you were contending with 17 years ago is quite different than now, I think, right? With the way we're relating, the way we're communicating, what a text message used to mean, what it means now. So I launched the Skin Deep, which was to explore that question, how are we shifting, how, how are we relating to each other differently? And then uh, the and is the kind of flagpole experience that we created. And that's what's won the Emmy. And that's what we sell our over half a million card games around the world and you know, really built uh, a community of, of people around that. Wow, that's truly fascinating. Can you tell us a backstory of how this project came together? When my parents got divorced as a young kid, I was three, four, mediating that. I think that left a little bit of a desire for connection. You know, I never, never saw my parents happy together. I knew something was not right. And I think as I grew up and I searched for myself, and I think I always had like an itch to see what intimacy means. I always had an itch to talk to people, ask them questions. And, you know, as life has it, one thing leads to another, filmmaking, uh, film directing, and then asking this question about the emotional experience, how's it shifting? And then, uh, you know what, let's do this experiment. Let's put two people in a room, have them ask questions, film it with three cameras. Um, and always show both both cameras at the same time. So you see people reacting to each other. And that seemed to reveal a lot about hum, human connection. That's how I kind of end up on it, ended up in the space. <laughs> as you hit record on that first session, what were your hypotheses, views, thoughts going into the project and, and how do they evolve over time? How good humans are at adapting. Okay. I mean, can, can you guys imagine working now without email or without cell phones? And yet a lot, we, we did it for centuries, you know, but yet now it's just, we take it for granted. So I think also love, I think has changed. I think now while our parents might've written love notes to each other and waited two, three weeks for a response if they were apart, now you send a text, a text or a voice note and it's a response immediately with, regardless of where they are physically and it could be across the world. And so the emotional experience of what it means to love, I think, is, is shifted. And yet we call it the same thing. And I think that's really interested, interesting. And that's why we started the project. I wanted to explore that. I want to explore how are relationships shifting and changing and how are we communicating differently? And so I know we all know love is a such a popular word and it so, means so many different things. But what, I've, what I feel is that, yes, it's an emotion, but it's also an act. It's an act that we can practice or that we can cultivate. When we have people sit down off of one each other, I'm not asking them about love per se. I'm just seeing them communicate with one another. Um, I do have, you know, when I look at the world around me and I see how we are communicating with each other, which is more of monologues. You send a voice note to someone else. They send a mo voice note to, 
to you. You talk on the phone, maybe, maybe it's on FaceTime, maybe it's not. Um, but how present are we being with one another? In the dating world, for instance, you're dating and you have multiple options that's on the background on all your on your own your dating apps if you're using them while you're at a date with someone. How invested are you in that moment of being present with them when you know that evening you can go and you can swipe and have five of the dates lined up, right? So how present are we being to one another? How invested are we in discovering one another? Um, you know, I think that's just, I think that's shifting. I think it's interesting. And I'm, I was speaking in the context of dating. If we're talking about a concept of a relationship, my question would be much like we do a check-in on a car, you check your car every, you know, do a checkup every 12,000 miles. Every, you go to the dentist once a year for your teeth or whatnot. How, if, how often are we doing check-ins on our relationship? How often are we creating the space to have a cathartic conversation? You know, if, if your partner comes home to you tonight, Johnny, and goes, I love you so much, you know, out of the blue, and I, you mean so much to me, it's out of the blue, you're not, what, you're not there to receive their comment about their love for you. You're wondering where is this coming from. Similarly, if, she came, if your partner came home and said, why do you love me? You're not wondering why you love them. You're wondering where is this coming from. So creating a space of inquiry, a space of conversation in which we can ask, well, constructive questions, I think, is key to creating the space for practicing love, if you will, right? Deeper relationship. But I think um, that's kind of what I've learned from the 10, 11 years of doing this with over 1,200 conversations that I've distilled in the book. And I think that we often take our relationships for granted that are closest to us, and we don't practice maintenance of the relationship. We don't take advantage of what's there for us because we take it for granted. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful parts of the project is it creates that space for two people to go into. What we're talking about now is technology is so infused in our lives. You know, even with your partner, they're thinking about email, they're thinking about work, their phone is dinging, they're not fully present. And then to drop on them, why do you love me? Could feel jarring if they're not expecting to go that deep right after dinner. So how do we create the space to give permission to give and receive? Right. And if you do this, why like road trips sometimes are great. If you're not listening to the podcast or music and you're on a road trip, there's nowhere to go. And then you're there for three hours, you start having conversations. And so then you're wondering where these questions are coming from. But you're in a car, you understand there's a context. Right. So how do we create the context? How do we create the space, which to me is really creating intention? And the difference between intention and agenda is intention is where you're starting from, where you come from. Agenda is where you expect to end up. If you go into a conversation, I'm really curious, I want to know why this or that happened, that's your intention. But if you want to have them apologize to you, that's an agenda. And the engagement you'll find from your partner or whoever you're speaking with will be different if you come with an intention versus having an agenda. Now, looking at creating that space, it seems like there's two real parts to it. The first is being present enough to listen. And then the second is being open enough to really share and explore those questions and ultimately yourself through that intimacy. So mm. I would love to hear a little bit on the first front, you know, what you've learned about listening through observing and, and watching two partners speak in this project and how that's changed your life and the way that you approach relationships. Man, it's, it's amazing. Like I'm thinking about how often do you get to really see people in an intimate conversation? You know, you don't, you have, I mean, you, you don't really, I mean, you, but because of this project where you bring them to a space where they kind of forget about the cameras and they're, and, and it's really because the questions are so well constructed that they drop into a real conversation. It, it's a wonderful window into relationships. And when you see that, you go, you start seeing yourself, you go, Oh, do I listen to my partner like that? Do I talk over them? Am I really present? Or, oh, I'm not the only one with that problem. And look at how they're solving it or looking how they're contending with it. And what's really an honor for me to have in doing this is that at this point, we're in 11th year and people now are showing up who first came across one of our videos, let's say Sidra and Ben, seven years ago when they were in their last year of university. And now seven years later, they're about to get married to the person that they're in a relationship informed by that video, informed by asking these questions. They buy the card decks and they're playing it on a weekly basis or whatnot with their partner. And the, the level of emotional articulation they have is shaped by the card games. It's shaped by the videos and them obviously doing it. And, and that's just an honor, right? And we, we just see that now. And 
we know we're having effect on people's relationships. And they're only able to have those relationships because they've seen it as a possibility. I think for me, the the part that I took away the from the opening part of the book really is recognizing that through our distractions in everyday life, we're maybe not as present to listening to our partner as we think. And yeah. the project itself creates that space where there is no phone. It's two people intimately together with zero distraction to really muster all of that listening power that creates the intimacy that we want, the connection that we want with our partners. So many of us are, are walking through life in a bit of a daze with our partners around the distractions and not taking the time to be fully present to listen to what they want to share. And then the, the second part of my question around, you know, how do you get open enough to share? I think yeah. these questions, and we'll, we'll dig into the questions themselves, they talk about topics and, and areas of exploration that might be really challenging to open up and share, even with someone you're intimate with for the first time. Bottom line is that it's not about answering the questions. It's about being present in the asking of them. Because you're there with someone. It, the intimate, like the book is not just for romantic couples. It's anybody you're intimate with. Your dad, your brother, your sister, your daughter, grandparent. You ask the question and you both sit there. When you do the end, you don't have to answer it. You have the right to take, take a pass. But just by asking the question, we're both sitting and our minds are answering it. I'm wondering how you're going to answer it. I'm wondering how I would answer it, right? We are having the conversation even if we might, might not be articulating it. And do we sit in that space? And that to me is, is what's key. And I think that's what's a little different than therapy, for instance. You go to therapy uh, and you have the referee or the person holding the space is the therapist and they're posing the questions. And what's helpful here, and it's not an either or, but what's different here and helpful here is that when you go home from therapy and if you want a conversation, you as a couple are not necessarily practiced at holding the space for each other. But by engaging with these questions or by the, 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 the decks for questions, but basically by sitting together and asking questions together, we are holding the space together. And that's what's really important to me. It's not necessarily what we say, but it's the, spa the questions we ask of each, of each other and how we sit in that. Right? Even if it's uncomfortable, especially if it's uncomfortable, because the more uncomfortable it is, the, maybe the greater the payoff. And I noticed that the question order matters. So they get it's deeper helpful. and more reflective as you progress. So it's not a book that you open to a random page and pick a question and say, okay, I'm going to fire it at my wife over dinner. There is a power to building the architecture, a sequence of questions. So for instance, you know, the, um, well, the twelfth, the last question is, why do you love me? Now, you can ask that first, why do you love me? We create the space, you go, why do you love me? We can start. But if by placing at the end of the journey, and we've gone through everything, that the answer to that question, the feeling of that question, what we'll say, my verbalize, has been built on an architecture of trust. We've leaned into discomfort. We've been on through something. We've expressed each other so that that will be that much more powerful in that architecture, in that sequence. So there is a, you know, just like anything, you know, just one note follows another note. It, you know, it, there's something about the architecture putting in a certain sequence that um, allows you to go deeper or to different places. So can you walk us through what we're trying to build in that architecture as we go through these 12 questions, what, what we're trying to draw from yeah. and connect with our partners on? Well, the first is a five-act structure. You know, the first three questions are about if the, the, the base of of the house, if you will, is what everything is built upon, which is our love, what brought us together, you know, what first connected us, what is the, what is the unique experiences that we created by virtue of our synergy? What are the things that connect us? One question is, when do you feel closest to me and why? Right? It's question number three. So those are the first three questions. Then we go into conflict. How are we starting to deal with conflict? What do, you know, what are you hesitant to talk to me about? What are you hesitant to talk to me about and why, right? What are you hesitant to ask me and why? So we start exploring what is the thing that we're not talking about. The next one is what's the biggest challenge in our relationship right now and what is it teaching us, right? So we're starting to explore what is the present. And then the next one is what is the sacrifice you feel uh, you've made that I haven't acknowledged and why do you think that is? So then we're dealing with the fact that someone did 
there was a challenge that one of us did not, we didn't contend with it, one of us sacrificed for it. So it's really dealing with the conflict and how we're dealing in different ways. And that's built us and brought us to the climax, if you will, which is, you know, what is the pain in me you wish you could heal and why? So that's the climax. And then we start dealing in act four would be the next two questions. Questions nine and 10 is about gratitude and appreciation. What are we learning from each other? And then the last two are acknowledging the things we should say because we don't have forever. If this were to be our last conversation, what is one thing you never want me to forget and why? And then number 12, of course, is why do you love me? So we take you on this journey. So from the past, the mutual trust and respect and the love that's created us now to how do we deal with conflict, to the vulnerability, the core, the climax, if you will, to then acknowledging each other, to then landing the plane conclusively with you know, if we never see each other again, what's, what's, what should I take away from us, our connection? So in looking at those questions, what I'm really curious about, and I know we talk a lot about asking great questions on the show to build connections. Yeah. What do you think is the secret ingredient to those questions or what makes those questions so powerful outside of the order in which they're asked? And we could go into all five things, but one thing that I think is interesting would be, it's really helpful if you ask a question that acknowledges the relationship, right? So if I ask you, AJ, what, do you, what scares you the most? You'll answer the question most likely in the same, the answer is the same, you know, snakes scare me the most. But if I ask you, if we change the question to, what do you think scares both of us the most? You'll answer that differently than if I ask it, the breeze asks it. Because it acknowledges the person asking, it acknowledges our relationship. So anytime you ask a question, if you can incorporate the, in a, the, in the question so that it acknowledges the people in the conversation, that elevates the question. And it also, you know, I'm more interested in your response because I'm involved in the, I'm, you know, the projection of what you think of me and our relationship is involved and therefore I'm more inclined to pay attention, right? But it illuminates our, the thread of our connection. I look at the responses to those questions. We're both looking at our own realities and perspectives of this relationship. And in the asking of those questions, you're now starting to look, what's the overlap of that Venn diagram? how you express mm. yourself, how I express myself, but how do we do that together in this relationship that we've built? And it gives you insight into how the person responding to the question feels about you and allows you to really reflect then what that person means to you in the context of the relationship, which is different than, hey, what are you afraid of? Or, hey, what'd you have for breakfast? Like, for instance, if you're meeting someone at a your social networking event and or your dinner party and you're saying someone, you say, hey, uh, what do you do, right? You could ask that question, which is kind of a scripted cliche one. But you could say like, what do you think we could do together? Like if we had to collaborate on something, what, what, what could we collaborate on? Because that in, 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 it inst, it immediately acknowledges my presence, you know, the presence of the two people. And now we're talking about something that if they turn around and ask the same question as someone else, it's going to be a different answer. Going through the exercise of writing my vows really thinking mm. deeply around what the relationship means to me, what love for us is from my perspective, and then hearing my wife's words back to me in that moment, I'm seeing through these questions and this space that you've created in this project happening for people in a structured way, but in a way that I think many of us don't ever get that reflection from our partner, our friends, our colleagues, our family members unfortunately, with the distraction we're talking about, but also with just our inability to really articulate our emotions. And I know writing my vows, I was grabbing a thesaurus and trying to figure out what are the other ways that I can express these emotions. And I feel in my experience as a man, I don't have many outlets where emotional articulation is asked of me. It's more... Mm -hmm. What's the data? What's the backstory? What are things that you can logically explain versus sit in those emotions and then articulate those emotions to someone that really matters to you, someone that you care about, who you want to hear their emotions as well. So as you've gone through this project and filmed, what have you recognized about people starting to open up that emotional articulation? And, and maybe what are some lessons that our audience can learn around finding these emotions if in hearing those questions you posed on this episode, they're a little bit standoffish or concerned how they would even respond in an environment to those types of questions? I think the first thing I'd say is what you practice at, you get good. So you don't have to be great at it. It's just, am I stepping in the space and practicing it? 
the first time I danced salsa, I'm not great at it, you know? And sometimes, I don't know if you guys ever dance salsa, you go to practice, but sometimes you're in a class and sometimes, you know, the teacher says, okay, you're going to sing, dance one song with one person, then you're going to shift over and dance another song with another person. And some people you're horrible and some people you're amazing because the chemistry is there. So be easy on yourself and, and practice it. And then also for the person who's inviting the other person to this space to have a conversation, you have to let go of the agenda. You have to let go of them behaving or responding in a certain way. Allow the human to be a human. Allow them to be who they are and allow it to be what it is. And at the core of that to me, it is deep listening. It's feeling to listen. It's not engaging the other person with your mind, which is built to protect, but engaging with your heart, which is built to connect. And so allow them to be who they are. And if that means that they don't articulate the way that you articulate, or this is who they are and this is the space you're in. And to appreciate that. For the one who's inviting the other person into the space who might be more reticent to, you know, partic- or not as practice. Right? And we all know there's many ways to express love, right? There's acts of love, acts of service, right? There's commun- but what I'm inviting is we have this tool, a tool of our voice, of our ability to communicate, to articulate things. So let's practice that because it's just one way of articulating our love, of our connection, of illuminating our connection. Yeah, and I think the beauty in that is hearing the response back. So walk mm. us through asking these questions. You know, you pose the question, the other person answers it. Do you then answer the question as well? How do you engage in conversation as you go through the exercise? Follow your gut, follow your body. Like, let it be what it is. I think oftentimes we're talking to each other with our, with our minds and not with our bodies, right? And like, what comes up? Oh, when you said that, I really feel this tension in my chest or my shoulders or my stomach. Like, what's that about? And just speak from there. Like, there are um, cultural mantras or scripted you know, cultural scripts that we follow. So for instance, I first noticed is when we did the dating, we did all these blind dates on the end. And I posed this question, which is, why do you think I'm still single? And this, I posed, I don't know how many couples it was. It was many of all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of experiences. 95% of the time, the answer was the same, which is because you're trying, because you're figuring yourself out first before you get in a relationship because you're figuring yourself out before you get in a relationship. That, wow, this is awkward. This is weird that so many different people are saying the same thing. Maybe that's a cultural script. And we all have cultural scripts. I mean, generally, remember living in LA? Like, there's a cultural script. What do you do? Where do you live? Where are you from? You know? How's the weather? I mean, how do we ask different questions that create different opportunities for exploration, different ways of being, right? That can avoid the cultural scripts, that can create real threads of connect, uh, bands of connection that are different than what we're normally used to. It's an opportunity. And by doing that, you just feel maybe a different sense of what it means to be alive, right? You're asking different questions. You're doing different things. And what's your advice to our audience who maybe isn't happy to hear the response from our, our partner or the person we're, we're asking questions? What do we do in a situation of conflict where the question goes a direction or an answer goes a direction we weren't anticipating or hoping for? I'll tell you my answer and then I'd love to hear your guys' answer because I think that's a good one. For me, I'd be grateful that I'm hearing what is true for them and that they're not being nice to me, but they're being kind. Because nice can be, you know, on the end we have this one woman who, I don't know if she quoted someone else, but she said, don't be nice. Nice is bullshit. Be kind. You know, nice is... I hit the ball in the, in, the, in the conversation. We're playing tennis, if you will. I hit the ball from my side. Then I run over to your side of the court and I hit the ball back because I'm scared about how it might affect you. And so therefore, I'm being really nice, but we're not really playing tennis. We're not really having a conversation that's really acknowledging your being and presence because I'm being nice. Kind is letting people know where you're at and how you feel and really acknowledging their, their presence and their own sense of agency and their own ability to articulate and be who they are. And so that's what comes up for me is if I hear what I don't like to hear, I think that's awesome because now we can start dealing with what is versus us being nice and playing around with the concept and we're not really dealing with what is. I mean, I say this because it sets a good line. Do I really believe it about myself? No, but, but it's like when I realized I was an asshole, okay? When I realized I was an asshole, okay, I started putting energy and dealing with the fact that I'm an asshole and changing it 
versus putting all my energy in just pretending that I wasn't. You know, where's the energy going? In up maintaining the uh, the conceit or the artifice or the impression of the concept or in actually dealing with what is. So if someone tells me what they really feel and where they're at, great, because now we're dealing with what is and we can actually start changing it and adjusting it. That's what comes up for me. What, what would you tell someone? Because that's a great question. What? Yeah, I think for me, it illuminates a part of your ego that's defensive. And that's an area to explore further. You know, what about that response from this person is bringing up that fight or flight response for you that you're defensive around, that you're frustrated with, that you weren't anticipating or hoping to hear from the person you're asking these questions of. And in that, really reflecting, okay, well, where is the truth here? Because that's their experience of me versus the experience that my ego is projecting outward and the way I'm behaving or communicating or how I want to show up in this relationship. And can we work to close that gap, right? Because mm -hmm. I feel like we really get into trouble when the gap of the other person's reality of us and our ego is massive. Right. I'm curious, watching these conversations as a third-party observer with you know, people that you're not in a relationship with, if there's any strategies or interesting moments that really stand out to you that were employed in these conversations that you're like, huh, maybe that's how I want to communicate. Maybe that's how I want to show up in, in interactions. Well, for, for me, the first one was when I saw Ben in Ben and Sidra series. They've been on, you know, they came on the first time two weeks before Sidra was giving birth to their daughter, Nyla. And they've been on, they were on last year when Nyla's nine now, and she's talking to her wow. mom. So they've been on eight times. So this project is amazing because not only does it have breadth of all kinds of relationship, but depth too, because yeah. people come back seven, eight times, and you're tracking how they're growing and changing, right? Just amazing. And an honor. And I remember watching Ben, and I, you know, you, you kind of get it when you see the bi panel. And I realized, wow, he doesn't respond until he has eye contact with Sidra. Hmm. And wow, he's taking a deep breath and really settling in before he responds. So he's not, he's kind of bypassing the initial reaction, which is the brain responding, the, me, the mind, and dropping into his body and breathing, because breathing is an access into the body. And he's responding from that space in eye contact. I go, wow, that is a great practice. Do I do that? So I remember that. I also remember seeing these patterns, like I mentioned, the blind date where people say, you know, where I see these societal proud, cultural mantras go, oh, how much of that is in my own programming? How much am I responding from that versus actually my experience, my unique experience? And the access point there is to, you know, what we call deep, deep listening, this, you know, feeling to listen and dropping in, and obviously the breath is a great way into that. Breath is a great way into the body, listening, and answering from that spot, which then elevates the conversation because then it becomes like, like two souls talking versus two, two minds talking. I think one of the most powerful parts of the project for me is the documentation aspect. So Johnny and I, in our week-long boot camp experience with our clients, we film them interacting as complete strangers with one another. And then we play the video back for everyone to view. And I've recognized patterns in communication from observing and watching others interacting. And that exact sensation I feel, even though I'm not in the interaction. So you can feel those tense moments, even as a third party observer, as two people are getting deeper in conversation, maybe expressing some things that have frustrated them, expressing some things they didn't feel comfortable sharing or talking about, even the audience can feel that. And you've documented this through the process. Again, I was saying, you know, how, how often do you see these intimate conversations? And it's really, I think it's a gift for me because it's elevated my relationship with my wife, you know, and brought that more conscientiousness to how am I listening to her? How am I responding? Right. And then, I know it creates, and I know this overused term, even almost as much as love, but empathy. Because you can have two people speaking about, let's say, incarceration, a father and daughter. And not everyone who's listening and watching this has been incarcerated. But they can all relate to a father-daughter relationship. And that's their way in. They can relate to that, and that's their way of creating empathy, right? And I think that's, frankly, I think we need more of that. And I think we also need more of listening. And if you think about, like, I appreciate that you watch the series, 
But what I think is beautiful about the ant too is that we're always showing you both people at the same time. And if you think of all the content that we watch, you're always seeing the people talk. You don't always see the people listening. Right. And you actually don't show it at the same time. So you have like someone talking and then you cut away to the listener and you cut for a reaction and you cut back. But you don't show both people at the same time. And when you show people at the same time, what you're saying is both are equally important. It's not just the talking. It's the listening too. Matter of fact, it's the conjunction of the two. And that's what creates the relationship. So if we focus on that, we focus on the listening, right? I mean, I'm, is, it's not just the speaking. I think that's beautiful. And if we can do that, the public as media and creating that, then other people see that and then they have more consciousness in their, in their conversations and the way that they show up for one another. And I think so much of this project can actually be that demonstration of what relationships can look like, all the various shapes and forms they take and, and how we can be more present and recognizing what our partner means to us and find the words, find the emotional articulation. It's like, you know, if I tell you, I'm like, AJ, you know, relationships, man, they're full of jealousy. There's just jealousy and all the, all the intimate, all the love, they're just full of jealousy, all these romantic relationships. Like Topaz, that's because you're 50% of all the relationships you're in. Let me show you some relationships where that's not the case. I go, oh, so there is another possibility. There's another relationship I can model. And where do we learn these things? We learn them at Art of the Charm through you guys, you know, in terms of how to communicate and how to be present. But we learn that from modeling our family, maybe Absolutely. in our friends group. And what's been beautiful about this is, no, actually here are all the different possibilities that, that can be there. And therefore, the relationships you are in become more an aspect of creation, of agency, than of like, falling into it and bringing in acceptance. So what are you shaping? What are you creating? And ultimately, what's in the book is a distillation of ha a tool, how to do that, which is holding the space where, of inquiry where you have well-constructed questions. You touched on this a bit earlier. I'm curious to hear in your self-reflection going through the project, what you've recognized about yourself and how you've changed the way you communicate with your partner. It happened definitely in the, when I was writing the book, and it's up with... Um, What's the pain in me you wish you could heal and why? Which is question number eight. How, you know, sometimes you're in a fight with a partner or they're going through something. They're going through something and you just want to fix it. You just want, you're, they're going through a big challenge. Maybe they're, you're, getting, you're getting, they're lashing out at you or something, but you want to fix it. And so you, you step in and you're trying to fix it. You're trying to help them through it. And the question I ask myself is I realize I can't heal them. I can't actually fix this for them. So the question isn't to ask myself, how can I fix this for them? The question is, how, what is the space that I'm holding for them so it's most conducive for them to find their way through it? And I would want to fix it for my wife, and, I would, and that would not help. And so I kept finding to ask myself, okay, what's the space I'm holding? Because maybe in the effort of fixing it, I'm actually, it's a disservice to the space that I'm holding. Absolutely. So that was a big learning, right? It's, so the emphasis is not, how do I fix it? The emphasis is, What's the space I'm holding? And sometimes the space you're holding is actually not you fixing it. And that's sometimes where there's a, that's one big helpful tool. The other one is when she would say something that I found would strike a chord in me, a wound, my reaction is to lash out or to respond, is to grab onto that breath between you know, you're like you're 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 jumping into a response mode and you're dead and you're going to the mind where you're defending us. It's like see if you can grab the breath before you actually enact that response. <sighs> Maybe some box breathing, bring it down. <sighs> okay, and then come from that space. Yeah. That's that's some learning I've had, you know, in directly with my relationship. Speaking about the first learning, what I find so insightful about that question as well is Oftentimes we may think we're through the pain and we've healed, but our partner has that perspective and can see through the mask that we've been wearing around the pain that they would love to heal for us. And then you actually kind of resent them a little bit. You're like, why are you bringing it back up? They're like, actually, no, they're doing you a service. Yeah. And they feel it too, right? By association, you feel it. You just can't, you see it, you know? And I think that that's, that's really interesting, right? And I think that's actually a mark of what a relationship is. Any kind Absolutely. of relationship. It's, these are the people closest to us. I will never see my own eyeballs. <laughs> I mean, I, in the mirror, but I'll never see my, but everyone else can. And they can reflect back to, I can see my own eyes through the reflection of someone else's eyes. Right? 
So the gratitude to the people who are close by and the service they're doing of reflecting. We can, we can be tailor-made reflections. How are we reflecting other people to themselves? That's a choice we can make. We could do that by the presence we bring to the conversation, how we listen, and the questions that we pose. You know, there's a beauty to that, and that's something that we should not take for granted. Yeah, I completely agree there. And, and the second part of that is actually giving yourself the space to respond, and not with the initial wave of emotion or reaction, but to slow your body enough to actually get into what's truly going on and not the defensive nature of that initial reaction to whatever you heard that you didn't like or disgruntled you. You know, I think it's important to make the distinction between comfort and safety. Absolutely. It's important to be safe, but you can be uncomfortable in safe. And that's actually a great place to be. I feel safe, but I'm uncomfortable because we're exploring certain issues that make me uncomfortable. And that exploration, that discomfort is going to give me fodder for growth, right? But oftentimes we confuse, well, if I feel uncomfortable, therefore I'm not safe. That's not necessarily true. Yeah, and in a lot of ways in these relationships, we need safety first to move to the mm -hmm. discomfort. And the discomfort, as you said earlier, actually leads to the growth. Yeah. So if reading these questions and hearing these questions on the show gave you massive pause around asking someone in your life these questions, look first, have we created safety in our relationship? Do we feel judged? Do we feel put on the spot? Do we feel like we can't be ourselves first? Because we can't actually get to the point of discomfort where the real growth happens if we don't have safety. And that's, that's what speaks to about creating the space. You know, if you say, hey, we're going to play this game or do the book, there's rules that come up. We're going to ask these 12 questions. You know what you're doing. And one of the rules is you don't have to answer the question if you don't want. You just have to ask the question. And you're the right to pass. So you're not forced to have a response. So there is a safety in the rules, right? There's a safety in the, gui the guidelines of the game. I think that's really helpful in terms of because otherwise, if you are going to have a talk with your partner somewhere and you're not in therapy, right, then what are the rules of that conversation? How will this go? Who's, who's asking the question? It, you know, just by asking the question, you have more power than the other. Because it's like, wait, you're asking the question. Now we're going to ask this, answer this question. And when it's coming out of a book or a random card game that we have, then already there's more equanimity in the conversation because the question is not coming from either of us. So. How do we approach that? I'm, I'm sensing myself in my relationship, but also I'm assuming a lot of our audience members, if one person listens to this podcast, discovers the book, and then <laughs> puts it in front of their partner, it can feel like a lot of pressure for the other person to be like, okay, whoa, now I got to answer 12 questions. I got to create space. So how do you approach the initial conversation proposing, hey, let's go through this exercise together? Make it an invitation. And again, that goes into your intention versus agenda. You know, if you want to ask the question of this book so that your agenda is that they ask you to marry them or that they tell you that they're really sorry about something, you have an end in mind. That's an agenda. They feel it. And now they're already, a, uh, you, know, you know, they're coming at it when playing emotional chess. But if you're intense, so then go into your curiosity. I really want to have this experience. I don't know where it's going to go. But my intention is clear. I want to explore a relationship. I want to ask these questions. They can feel that. And you tell them, hey, the rules of this game is that we're just going to ask the questions. We don't have to answer the question if we don't want. Gives them freedom. Gives them permission to be who they are. Right? And I think you could feel that. And I think the hardest thing is we've, we've seen that generally there's one person that really wants to have a conversation and have this experience. And the other one that's reticent and doesn't. And what's important is to acknowledge that you, you know, you articulate, hey, I really want to have this experience. Can we set the time to do that? And your partner, if they just flat out reject it over and over again, I'm sure there's other things in a relationship that are asked of them that are rejected as well. Right. So this is not just the only thing. So there's a, an issue. But if they're to say, okay, I'll do this. I, they don't want, have to want to do it. But if they say, okay, we'll do it because I love you and I want to have this experience, it means, okay, let's do it. You have to come to it, with it without the agenda and you have to accept them for who they are. You can't expect them to answer things with their emotion articulate that's poetic and loving as much as you are. This is who they are. Most likely they're a compliment to you. So if you really like bathing in emotional space, probably they don't. That's fine. But you're giving them permission to be who they are. And so therefore you're telling them, it's okay. Thank you for doing this with me. And by doing that, then what happens next is next time you invite them, it's not so scary for them. And now they'll do it again. Kind of like the first time you ride a bike, you're scared of falling over and you do. 
But the second and third time you get better at it, by the fifth time, you're like, yeah, let's go for a journey. No problem. And you get better at it. So I think it's important is that for the person who's inviting the other in is to let them be who they are. Let them know the intention is that's part of creating space. Let's have a conversation. I don't know where it's going to go, but I really want to explore it. Cool. I don't have an end game in mind. And matter of fact, if you don't want to answer anything, so be it. And if you're not going to be poetic, I'm not, I don't expect you to be poetic. Let's just be here together. And it's a practice. Right? I mean, you are practicing the, the, the words for your, the vows. But now you do it again, you have another conversation, it gets easier and then it becomes more flowery and it's different. And now you start expressing yourself in a different way you didn't before, but that's because you're practicing it. And how do you approach the preparation for the conversation? Should both parties read the book in its entirety and know the questions beforehand? Because a lot of our listeners are, you know, they go above and beyond. We're talking 110% <laughs> here. And I can yeah. see them, you know, drafting thousand word responses to these questions before they even get in front oh. of their partner. No, so then I would say, I would say, don't read the book. I would say, actually, what I would say is I'd read part one, which is creating the space, and I read part three, which is troubleshooting, like if shit hits the fan, what, what do we do? do about it? And I would skip part two, which is breaking down each question and why it works. I would just read creating the space, troubleshooting, and then I'd say, hey, let's play the game. And the less you prepare for it, the better. Because when you prepare for it, what that means is that you're, you're coming from the brain, from the mind. And the mind is built to protect you. It's not built to connect you. The heart's built to connect you. And part of the heart is the body. It's being present. So be in the space and see what comes up. You don't have to have the right answer. You just have to have the answer of the moment. And that's also why it's beautiful. Because these 12 questions, you can ask them now. You can ask them in a year with the same person. And I promise you, the response is going to be different because you've changed. Your relationship's changed. It's grown, right? And so the key to me is not in the preparation. It's in the presence. And if, and if that means the preparation is so that you're present, great. If that means we're going to prepare a time so that we're going to put the phones aside, we know the kids are not running about, or there's no construction next door, we have a time, prepare like that. But don't prepare the answers because that's preparing the agenda. Prepare the intention, prepare the space, and prepare to be present. And after observing all of these different couples and conversations, were there any patterns to length of time spent together and how they responded to these questions and, and found the emotional articulation? Was there anything that you found through all of these as signs to you that, wow, this is a really deep relationship, beautiful relationship? I mean, AJ, you, you, on your website, you're like 9,400 people you guys have affected over 17 years. I don't know if it's for you. But for me, I sit there and I'm like, oh my God, there are as many stories as there's sands of sands on the beach. Like every grain of sand on the beach. There's as many stories. Every relationship is so different. Right? It's just unique. And the way of expressing love could be totally different. The father might not respond to one question of the daughter, but you know he loves his daughter so much. You could feel it in the room. Right. And then you have there are so many different stories. There's so many different, every relationship is its own unique language and world. And it's just an honor to be in that space. And, and, you know, I've seen for me, certain patterns come up or certain things come up in cultures. So we filmed in Amsterdam and we noticed that, wow, these conversations go for about an hour and 20 minutes. And then you're sometimes in other cultures, um, you're in Ohio and the conversation is 45 minutes for some reason. <laughs> you know, like much quicker, but you never know. You, you never know. Um, you know, yeah, just every, every relationship is different. I have noticed that, you know, we filmed in, um, Quebec and when they spoke those, all those relationships, whatever it was in romantic or otherwise spoke about sex much more free than let's say the American culture. Like there are cultural norms, right? There's cultural right. waters that we swim in that, give permission and not for certain kinds of conversations that for sure. Um, but specifically I haven't noticed anything beyond that. And then anything beyond the kind of the societal scripting that we have cultural yeah. launches that we have for one another. Yeah. I think the, the interesting part again, just as an observer is to be able to watch and witness how different cultures approach these answers and the depth at which they explore the emotions behind these answers I think just as a passive observer, even if right now you don't feel that you have a relationship that you want to pose these questions to, it's just such a powerful project to just observe 
and mm-hmm. look at your own reaction and response as you're watching two people share their answers that you don't know. I just think it's a missed opportunity to go through life and not articulate your connection and reflection that you offer others and they offer you, especially the ones closest to you. And when you do that, you feel a greater sense of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive. And I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's scary, but I think there's a greater payoff and that's why I'm suggesting it's worth it. Yeah, and I I love that it can be revisited. My wife and I did the exercise of writing our vows again to each other a year later to celebrate and they were different. Mm-hmm. As our relationship has, has grown and evolved after getting married. So I think even if you go through the exercise once, it's just a great way to stay connected and, and check in with someone who's very important in your life around how they view and feel you in this present moment. And there's a lot of power in the writing of the questions. So they're constructed in a way that it's not like, what is our biggest conflict? It's what do you think it is, right? So then it's subjective versus objective. If you tell me what is the biggest, or why do we fight so much? It's like, well, because of this and that. Well, no, it's because of that. But if I say, why do you feel? I can't really argue with that. That's your opinion. And then I'm hearing you, I'm seeing you. And ultimately, as humans, don't we just want to be seen? Ultimately, we want to be seen, and yet it's scary to be seen, it's scary to be vulnerable. But when you are seen, when you are fully seen, it gives you a greater sense of what it means to be alive. And a big part of that being seen is having your emotions heard and validated, even if your partner doesn't agree with you feeling that way. It, absolutely. And that's where it comes to the power of the question, because if the question is, what is objectively, then you're arguing about the objectiveness objectivity like objectively the truth but instead it's like, if you shape the question what's the subjective truth then that's setting me up to see you okay that's how you feel wow i'm sorry you feel that way right and so we that's why for me ultimately if there's one thing i just the bottom line that i've learned from this experience is stop looking for answers create better questions put all your focus on the questions and then the answers become easier more obvious and more helpful Yeah, I think the most valuable lesson here is the power of curiosity, even with the Mm. people we spend the most time in our lives with, as we talked about earlier, in our distracted, technology-driven world, to take the moment and the space to be fully present and curious about this person that we love and care so deeply about. Yeah. So where can our audience find out about the project and the book? Uh, so the book is available everywhere, Amazon, you know, audiobook, uh, ebook, it's it's every anywhere you get your books, so it's it's available. And then the skindeep.com is where you can get all our products and the card game editions and everything. And um social media is the skin deep. Just look up the skin deep on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, anywhere, Facebook, and you'll find us. Well, thank you for joining us. What's next for you? Raising my kids. <laughs> Raising my kids. <laughs> Maybe another book. We'll see filming more of the ands around the world. So continue to continue to to share stories. Beautiful. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Thanks, AJ. Appreciate you, man.